Um, hey, aloha everyone. Um, aloha pumehana kako, aloha mai uh, kako, and um, so awesome to see you all and to see friendly faces. Thanks for coming along. Um, uh, I guess I've, I've already had a really lovely introduction, so I don't need to say anything about those things. Um, but I'm really glad to be here today. Languages are um, close to my heart. Um, probably just uh, by way of placing myself within the context of this conversation. Um, my grandparents uh, in Hawaii were the generation that grew up, um, uh, and my mother actually, having the law prohibit the use of Hawaiian in public spaces, including schools. Uh, my grandparents spoke Hawaiian, Olelo Hawaii, um, at home fluently, and they would speak to each other and their brothers and sisters um, and others uh, in that language. Uh, but my mother and her siblings, um, growing up in Hawaii in the 1950s and 60s, do, do not speak fluently. It's something that bothers them. It's something um, that is kind of hard. Um, and in 1978, um, John Waihe'e, uh, like one of our first native Hawaiian governors in Hawaii, um, was part of a movement to uh, amend the constitution in the state of Hawaii to um, uh, really to make sure that the Hawaiian language was, was taught in schools. Um, and, and it, but it wasn't until the early 1980s that that law was actually repealed. So um, I come to this um, as an adult who's um, learning. And I don't come to this as a linguistics person, specialist. I come to this as a legal scholar with, uh, you know, who dabbles in some other things. Um, and and um, from, from working with Pacific people and communities and, um, and, and in education spaces. But thank you so much. Mahalo nui. So uh, I just want to get started um, by talking uh, about a really special lady. So, um, so the, the people of Hawaii and Kanaka Maoli, Kanaka Iwi people, and Kanaka Maoli means kind of like Maori, like you're the regular people of, of that country. Um, I prefer Kanaka Iwi because it means that we're come from the bones of those people. It's like iwi, the word iwi here. Um, and it means that your genealogy, your whakapapa or your mo'oku aho comes from Hawaii. So, um, so Kanaka uh, Maoli, Kanaka iwi people owe a lot to um, this lovely lady. Her name um, is Mary Kavena Pukui. Um, over the course of her lifetime, she would write, she would uh, research and write and publish and, and then update and amend and publish again some of the most important um, kind of reservoirs or repositories of Hawaiian language that we have today. Um, so um, in, in kind of the interest of today, I, I thought of her as a mother of languages um, and uh, so she was this in many ways. She was a scholar, a linguist, um, a composer, a translator. She, she was a kumuhula or a hula teacher um, and, and really a hula master. Um, her body of work included more than 50 books that she wrote or co-authored in more than 150 songs. Um, and it's been described as the backbone of Hawaiian culture and language. Uh, significantly contributing to um, the preservation and revitalization efforts of Kanaka Maoli. So, so this body of works um, includes, um, as I said, a dictionary, um, a book on grammar, um, and then these Hawaiian proverbs and poetical sayings, which we call Ololo no Eau. Um, one of the ones I really love is, is this one, Ua lehu lehu a mano mano i uh, or ka ika ikena um, aka Hawaii. So um, great and numerous is the knowledge of the Hawaiians. Um, and um, uh, today I'll kind of propose that great and numerous is the knowledge of Pacific peoples, um, which just as we see here is contained in language. 
So um, um, I feel really inspired by, by this, uh, by her work. Um, and um, even um, to the point where she has these, she's collected olelo no iao um, that place you right where your ancestors came from. So um, if you look through her 2,401 or however many olelo no iao are in this volume, um, there's even one for Laie, where, you know, where our family comes from, or one of the places where our family comes from, um, which, which talks about um, the twin girls that Laie is named after, and talks about Laie Ikevai, um, who was the, the twin that got taken away and trained by a tohunga, right? Um, our, our word is kahuna. So they're quite amazing. And that's the ahupua'a that, that I associate with. So um, uh, Pukui was a fluent speaker of Olelo Hawaii, and that's really important. Uh, she uh, was raised in a family who passed down volumes of knowledge um, in this oral tradition to Pukui. Um, and throughout these volumes and others, one is struck by the extraordinary breadth of her knowledge, um, the painstaking efforts and sacrifices that it must have required um, to put those volumes together. Um, she literally had to just go around and talk to people um, about their local Olelo no Iao, right? Um, it's quite, quite extraordinary. So she, she visited everyone in every island. Um, so her commitment to ensuring that our culture, our language, and our history um, would continue is quite apparent. And she was still contributing to this work into her 90s. So um, I think the most recent edition of the Olelo no Iao book is uh, in, in the night is like 1986 and she would have been like about 90 at that time so it's quite extraordinary um, now in the forward to this 1986 edition um, a close colleague and friend of Pukui described her in this way um, quote she makes us a gift of the lay of knowledge that she has spent so long collecting unquote in Hawaii and other places in Moana Nui Akea the Pacific area of the Pacific Ocean um, in places such as the Cook Islands, um, lays are a gift. Um, the, uh, one of the last, uh, probably the, yeah, two, two trips ago, uh, one of my cousins um, who, who lives there sent her husband to an outer island um, to gather maile. Hawaiians love maile. And it's this very fragrant plant. You don't even love it because of the flowers. You love it because the leaves are fragrant. Um, and her husband went to another uh, island to get those uh, for me, uh, for my visit. And so the whole trip, I had this lay sitting in my hotel room with this beautiful smell of my lay. And you don't take that and just lightly throw it in the rubbish when you're done. You stick that into the refrigerator um, every chance you get so that it will last. Um, and uh, because someone has made that for you, they've gathered those things for you and they've made that for you and it's very precious. And he knew, uh, he knew that Hawaiians love Miley, good Miley. It was better than I, our Miley, but I tried not to tell my mom that. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, so, so, so when Pukui is described in this way, um, I, I propose that it's because of a couple things. One, uh, she, her gift is such a treasure. Uh, she is herself a gift and a treasure. Um, but what she presented us to through the Hawaiian language um, is quite a gift and a treasure too. Um, so I'd like to talk more about that. Um, uh, today I hope to share a few thoughts on the gift of the lay of knowledge that comes from mother languages. Um, Mother languages are gifts, not least because they can teach us about transformative education outcomes. And um, as I said, by way of disclaimer, I'm not gonna approach this like a ling linguist, um, but, um, but I'll share a little language. Um, yeah, mahalo. Um, and of course, uh, being Kanaka Mali, Kanaka Iwi, I don't represent all the diverse Pacific peoples um, of Mauna Nui Akia. Um, but I hope I will share um, what I've learned from them in observing the, uh, these wonderful people and working with them. So, um, oh, and lastly, I especially honor our, our tutus, our grandmas and grandpas, the mamas and the papas, and our tohunga es experts um, and scholars for their generous sharing of precious knowledge. So, 
Um, mother languages, issues and challenges. So um, I don't know if you guys have noticed, but we're living in a very complex time. Um, I don't know. Um, and, and, um, and, and it has these, uh, these complexities have a real impact on education as we've seen over the last few years. So um, on one hand, mother languages are key to transformative education and inclusive societies, um, but they're under threat and frequently narrated as endangered, even uh, by people with the best intentions, right? Um, and we kind of want to draw attention to the fact that those languages are in danger, um, but if we leave it at endangered, we're, we're going to miss something, right? Um, which is why I get to talk today. <laughs> All right. Um, so places like Hawaii demonstrate the benefit, um, and, and why this matters, right, is that places like Hawaii demonstrate the benefit of multicultural, multi-ethnic, and linguistic societies, um, which um, if you look at some of the, I think it would have been three or four years ago, I, I believe it was pre-pandemic, um, that Hawaii, for instance, was voted um, the best place for gender equality in the United States. Um, and there's been a number of studies about the impact of um, living in a place where different cultures and ethnicities and languages are, are accepted, um, right? So Hawaii's been studied in that way. Having said that, we live in New Zealand, um, and even here in the Waikato, we're in a very multicultural, multi-ethnic place. Um, I really love going to the base, um, our local shopping center, for those of you who are zooming in, um, and just seeing how multicultural we are becoming in the Waikato and in Hamilton. It's really quite extraordinary. Um, so you can hear Tagalog, you can hear Spanish, um, and, and on and on. So, um, on the other, uh, and, and not on the other hand, so New Zealand has also been hospitable to Pacific languages in a way, like in a formal way, in a way that other places haven't. So I think we're up to 11 Pacific language weeks now. Um, and so, of course, um, uh, we've benefited from models of te reo Māori um, and revitalization there, but it's extraordinary to live in a country where your government recognizes minority languages like that. So to put it into perspective, the United States would never do such a thing. <laughs> the, the federal government in the United States would never do such a thing. They have a hard time accepting minority rights of any kind, including language rights, including Spanish, which is now spoken by a sizable chunk of their population. So uh, some of the other neat things we've seen, of course, is that the NCA changes. Um, as I know, as um, complex and contentious as those have been at times, um, those promise uh, that we'll see more Pacific languages in, in our NCA curriculum and that students will be given more credit for those. So it's those kinds of nuts and bolts things too that are really exciting. But we also know, I recently read that Pacific language fluency, and there's a report by Treasury um, just last year by Sua, led by Sua Thompson, Sua Kevin Thompson, um, that was talking about uh, one of the things they found in the data they were looking at is that Pacific language fluency is declining in New Zealand, which is um, extraordinary given all of these efforts. Um, so studies have shown that Pacific New Zealanders who do not speak their mother language uh, do not feel as connected to their island culture or community, um, and that's an issue because many of us have found in our own research that, of course, connection to your language, culture, and community is a plus, and it's a success factor. So uh, like climate change narratives about Pacific people, our languages are frequently narrated as if we are an endangered species. Um, and that should bother us too because of those dying race narratives from the 19th and 20th centuries. So now globally, some other fun stuff happening in the world. Um, we've got some uh, different tensions, populism, um, intolerance and racism. I was watching a documentary yesterday about the rise of strong men again, um, the likes of which we've not seen um, since World War II. Um, right? Um, well, no. Post-colonial and um, some really evil dictators in different places in the world, right? Um, and then World War II. So 
Um, along with uh, some of the stuff that we're seeing, uh, we're also seeing uh, a rise in call f more, uh, so increased calls for monolingualism again. Um, and we are hearing these in New Zealand. So the stated intent of the government in regards to Te Reo Māori is gravely concerning. The potential fate of all the gains um, that we have made for Pacific languages um, will be influenced by that, um, no doubt. Um, and, and so our, the, our fate remains really uncertain. Uh, because the inclusion of language and culture can improve outcomes in the classroom, um, these linguistic um, threats are also educational threats. Um, we've learned in the past, um, over decades and decades, and really through the experiment of colonization uh, by education um, and even integration, uh, that one-size-fits-all education is not effective um, and it's not really neutral. Um, so legal and policy efforts such as the No Child Left Behind Act 2000 in the states um, actually created these perverse incentives um, whereby um, standardized testing and your funding relying on standardized testing, of course, um, led to perverse outcomes where minority students um, and many students who were different in the classroom were left behind, ironically. Um, now, monolingualism is also the linguistic equivalent of the virulent democracy threatening authoritarianism and populism that's on the rise, as I said, and these would-be rallying cries of monolingualism are full, just full of things that sound like fascism and racism um, and world wars. So post-pandemic, education systems and institutions are struggling to get students back to class. And um, those of you who work with teachers in the classroom or have been teachers in the classroom know this really well. Um, the, our, you know, uh, we're, we're lucky um, in some places to be back up to 40% attendance in some, of, some schools in some areas. Um, and then uh, there is a call, right, because of um, PISA scores and other achievement scores um, to focus on basic reading and math, um, which also takes the focus away from things like languages. Um, so we, we've kind of all heard, uh, seen these headlines as well and heard promises about um, basic reading and math being the focus. Um, but we're also in the midst of these wicked, messy challenges like climate change and we've experienced the pandemic. We've learned some interesting things there. Um, these are challenges that fundamentally threaten the human right to education and in fact, um, I think probably in the first several months of the pandemic, um, the UN Secretary General Antonio Gutierrez um, basically called um, the pandemic a generational education uh, or generational catastrophe for, for the right to education. Um, and he was especially worried about girls. So um, uh, we're also in an information age um, where by all um, kind of indicators, our students need a certain level. We want everyone leaving high school um, and our institution to have some level of STEM skills, especially digital skills. The, the critical ability to sort through a vast amount of information um, and be able to engage with that in a way that protects you <laughs> and um, helps you get through the world, right? And into, um, careers, for instance, that are future-proof. Um, so that's some of the things that we've got to think about. And we know from the Treasury report that Pacific people are already getting left behind in terms of those particular kinds of jobs. So last but not least, um, we have um, the ongoing issue of equity and equality for girls and women in education. And Pacific women, um, we also know uh, from the work of our Equal um, Rights Commission or Equal Opportunities Commissioner, um, uh, uh, I think in 2022, I think that's when the report came out, that Pacific women experience um, the largest pay equity gaps. So things like that future of work, um, right, things like that future of work situation are Will, will really magnify these disparities and gaps. Um, 
And uh, we know that Pacific uh, people also have these biggest disparities in terms of well-being. So that's in the Treasury report from last year. Um, now, education, well, educated women and girls, and here's the clincher, right, where society also misses out, is that educated women and girls are a defining factor in the realization of human rights. And they're, they're what I have called previously organic multipliers. <laughs> so, um, so organic multiplication is, is this, this funny tendency of human rights um, uh, to multiply one another and to open bridges and open doors and gates and options um, in real life, but on the ground, uh, something like the right to vote and be, uh, participate in political, the political discussions um, that happen during an election will be practically useless if you don't know how to read and write, right? Um, and in an information age, you also have to do that in a digital space and know how to do that. So, um, so what the UN and other people know is that when you want to get things done, you get the women going, <laughs> even though we love our tane, we love our kane. Um, but, but when the UN right has, has this kind of MO of working with the women in a place to get them going and them educated, and in fact, um, in studies um, way back to 2009 um, that talk about the double dividend of gender, um, you can see on one hand how um, uh, an, an uneducated woman has all these flow-on effects for her children and her community, whereas an educated woman will also have these wonderful flow-on effects for her community. So, um, we know weird stuff like children under five tend to, you know, live longer if they're, well, so women, educated women, I better say this properly, educated women tend to not have children that die under the age of five. Stuff like that, right? Um, their children tend to not live under the poverty line. They tend not to be exploited and work in dangerous work. That, these weird things. They tend not to be child soldiers. Weird stuff, which seems far away, but it actually, that actually happens in places. So, um, so, so there's really interesting and powerful um, things about women that we have to keep in mind when we think about whether the right to education is, is real for women around us. Okay, so I have talked a little bit about why we might want to invest uh, time and effort and funding um, into uh, preserving, revitalizing, promoting, and legally protecting mother languages. And I really was also struck by this, these numbers um, to think that children around the world, 40% of the children around the world will go into a classroom where they don't understand anything is the height of some form of discrimination. Um, it breaches natural justice and that is just weird, right? That's weird. Um, it puts that child at an a priori disadvantage before um, they pick up a pencil or open a book or anything. Um, and that's really quite concerning. So of the 7,000 languages spoken in the world, um, we have more than a thousand, I, I wanna say more than a thousand, I think it's, it's well over a thousand, but I don't have the, um, sorry, my mind's blank on the exact number, but there's a sizable chunk of those languages that are in the Pacific. So for instance, um, in Papua New Guinea, um, and we have a growing Papua New Guinean um, community here in New Zealand, there's at least 800 languages, and that doesn't count dialects. Okay, that's just languages. So, um, um, so as Nicholas um, introduced as well, um, these are some of the considerations about why this is important besides the numbers. Um, but one of the most interesting things um, that, I, that I found when I was digging around UNESCO's um, documents was um, that monolingualism actually is linked to people asking questions about the relevancy of education as a whole, right? Um, and, and so um, part of UNESCO's work is working on um, making sure that we're articulating education in a form that remains relevant for learners. Um, 
so on one hand, we've got to um, be able to show learners that there's a job at the end of this, like, why are you doing this? What's at the end of it? Um, coming out of Victorian times, education was a privilege, and, and there were generations that were happy just to be able to get an education, just like being able to come here and get a tertiary education. Um, but um, in a world with diverse, very diverse options, and lots of pressure for things like driving a forklift, or you know, making quick money in a post-COVID economy where, where costs are high, um, we've, we've actually got to be able to, to articulate our relevancy. Um, and it's really important. But so does the right to education. So that's part of UNESCO's work at the time as well. And in fact, um, some of the stuff they talk about is how um, if you walk into a classroom where you don't speak the language and your education is not going to be a great one, why would you stay there? Right. Yeah. Have any of you seen a great movie called Vi? You can smile at me if you have. Okay. Um, it, I, I'm trying to remember. I think I saw it on TV and Z Plus for those of you who are coming in from Aotearoa, New Zealand. Um, and it's a wonderful, wonderful movie. So um, uh, Vi is uh, across the Pacific in many countries and this name was chosen specifically. So I'll explain a little bit about the movie. The movie is, was made by, I think, something like nine Pacific women filmmakers, uh, filmed over like seven different countries um, and contains seven different languages. So I think they come to Aotearoa like twice and then they like, they're mostly like speaking English and New Zealand slang. But um, all, of, all of the women in the movie, going from a little girl up to an older, an older woman, um, represent the same woman over the course of a lifetime. It's a, it's a really great film, okay? And um, through the course of her life and all of the scenes, there's always like rain or the ocean. Sometimes the, the, this woman in these different stages of life, either as a Solomon Islander or a Samoan in, South, you know, in Auckland, or um, there's usually rain or ocean or some form of water. And um, in some of the, the scenes, uh, they're actually on the Moana. So none of this is by accident. So just like in Te Reo Māori, wai meaning water, vai in many places across the Pacific means water. And for some of us um, for, uh, who have vai in our names, uh, like myself, um, vai refers to the ocean. This great ocean, um, what we in Hawaii call Moana Nui Akea, or the ocean of the great expanse. And I always think of that as the ocean of the great opportunities, mm -hmm. the great possibilities. Um, and I think, I'm going to guess, I kind of think that's what our ancestors thought as they were sailing into this very largest thing on planet Earth. It takes up one third of the surface of the Earth, 995 parts water to five parts land, or less by some estimates and you can't see the next island, and therefore you've got to be very smart um, as you're traveling across it. So of course, our ancestors developed wayfinding skills that were kind of off the charts. Um, the things that they did um, to settle the Pacific, and not in a wayward, haphazard, accidental fashion, but actually in a very studied, very smart way, um, where they kept supplies and took crops that were the best ones to grow in any island, right? The most like drought resilient crops with them. Um, that all happened over a few millennia, but um, it's amazing. And what makes it more amazing is no iPads, no books, no sextants, your hand measuring angles, um, but mathematical knowledge, sci biological knowledge, medicinal knowledge, historical knowledge, um, only up here for generations. And so in Hawaii, we have things like the Kumulipo. The Kumulipo is a creation chant, um, which is 2,102 lines long. Um, it takes a, f I, I have not done this, I'm, uh, I have not done this. Um, 
but um, uh, by my understanding, it takes quite a long time to recite. Even here in New Zealand, um, famously, some tohunga, when they were teaching some chants like this, would start chanting at about dinner time or right after dinner uh, on a Saturday night, and they'd still be chanting early the next morning, right? Um, and that genealogy, interestingly enough, uh, it's the genealogy, especially of the Uluhema line in Hawaii, which is the, an especially important genealogy for <laughs> chiefliness in Hawaii. Um, but it links those chiefs back to 800 generations of, through 800 generations of time, back to the creation of all things, um, and back to things like sponges and the moana, right? So um, amazing knowledge um, in these places. Um, now, in words like ohana, so if you've watched Lilo and Stitch, which I have mixed feelings about, but um, people know this about me. Um, but if you see words like ohana um, and ainga in Samoa and kainga um, in places like Aotearoa and in Kiribati, um, that word, if you trace that back um, through islands, um, there's this really important connection between your kind of central identity, your family, or your genealogy, um, the, your place, the, the place and the land that you come from, and then everything else encapsulated in this one word. So ohana um, is oha and aina, and oha is the part of the taro root, uh, the kalo root, that roots into the ground and links you to that place. Um, and the other part is ain, aina, for us is land, and you can hear that in these words ainga and kainga, uh, meaning home and um, your kind of extended kinship group um, in places like, sorry, I'm looking at my, my Samoan friend. Um, uh, so in Ngana Samoa, that's, um, that's, all of that is there in the word ainga, which we frequently use here in Aotearoa. So the important part about these languages is they're repositories of knowledge, they're virtual libraries of knowledge, um, and the trick is translation is limited, right? To fully translate that word is really almost impossible. You kind of have to live that word. So the example that I always use is that when I was growing up, um, and this is, these are the beautiful things in my mother's scoldings. Um, so when we were little, um, uh, one of the things that we were taught is don't be maha oi. And maha oi is, um, it contains all these things. So I could say that it's kind of like when you go visit somebody else's house, don't be cheeky and don't ask for things that don't belong to you. And in fact, don't ask for anything. Don't be greedy. Don't ask for stuff. Be really humble and sit back and just, no, 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 auntie. And your, your job is to say, no, thank you, no, thank you, um, and not put anyone out, right? So that's part of that. But really, there's so much more in that word um, that, like when you try to explain it, it takes you essays to try to explain. And then unless you've lived it, you may not understand it. So, um, if you're feeling like, maha oi, it's all right. This is how I feel when my Fijian friends try to explain sautu to me, which is this holistic well-being. I understand it at that, at, at that level, but they keep teaching me things, and I, I know I haven't got it yet, okay? So, so these are the limits of translation, and that makes the language really important to preserve because it's the repository, it's the vehicle, and everything else. Okay, so... Sorry, our first lesson was to treat mother languages as virtual libraries. Um, our second language is um, that transformative education will not happen if we repeat the mistakes of the past. And the Pacific, really this beautiful ocean um, of the great expanse and possibilities, um, has also had its fair share of apologies um, over the last several years. Um, and other things that have gone unaddressed. So um, uh, another olelo noyao that I like um, is this one, of, uh, which is um, pretty straightforward. Um, ikava ma mua, ikava ma hope, which um, if you know your te reo Māori means that pretty much to look forward, you've got to look back, right? Um, so 
uh, we've had the la over the last few years, we've had a series of um, our last couple of decades. We had the Clark government, I think in 2001, um, make some apologies for things that happened during New Zealand's administration of Samoa, colonial administration of Samoa. Things um, that were still hurting people, um, things that people remembered. Because in the Pacific, we don't really forget a lot. We remember. Um, and then we have things like, um, uh, so then we have things like blackbirding. Um, does everybody know what blackbirding is? So yeah, hopefully this is some of the things that we'll be learning in the new history curriculum. Um, so blackbirding was a euphemism for a form of slavery whereby 100,000 Pacific people from islands ranging from the Solomon Islands and Vanuatu, uh, Fiji, places like that, uh, so Samoa, Tonga, um, uh, the middle of the Pacific, Hawaii, um, and as far east as Rapa Nui, that's about as far east as you can go um, with, our, with our Ohana, um, people were, were stolen. They were tricked into thinking they were going into work and were really enslaved. Um, and uh, so uh, I think it was just like last year or the year before um, that the, um, a Queensland mayor apologized for uh, the role of Queensland in blackbirding. And that's because about 65,000 Pacific people ended up on the plantations in Queensland. Um, however, Pacific people were also bought and sold and traded um, in ports like San Francisco and Honolulu and Auckland and Akaroa. Okay. Um, so those, those are the histories that tragically link Pacific people to this place. Um, and later there were some indentured servitude schemes that were not much better, right? So those are those funny things. And then there's places like Banaba, which is now um, part of uh, the Republic of Kiribati. And Banaba was once an island with a mountain. Um, it was leveled for phosphate. Um, tragically, as, they, as this British company that New Zealand was a part of mined that mountain, they also took the, the iwi, the bones of the people there, um, so, uh, and ground them up. They became part of fertilizer that was, um, according to Katarina Teaiwa, um, who's a Banaban and a Fijian um, scholar here in New Zealand, um, was then sprinkled over farms in Canterbury and Gisborne. So um, there's this weird twist that the bones of those people are actually in this country. Um, but we just don't think about that. So we, of course, have the impact of colonization by education. And I, um, this, is, this has been a little bit of my research, which was, you know, in some places a really brutal thing, um, uh, brutal, violent, corporal punishment for speaking your language, as we talked about. Um, and basically taking decision making away from Pacific peoples and reorienting that education system to, um, to, to a Western construct of what education should be. So you can imagine the impact of that on a culture that um, has thrived with oral history and oral culture and oral repositories of knowledge when you're forbidden to speak your language. In other places, it wasn't forbidden legislatively. It was just really hampered by benign neglect and fiscal neglect as well. So um, we know that that kind of law policy and decision making and the impacts it had on language continues to stay with us. And we see similar things coming through different systems. Um, so that won't be a surprise to anybody. Now, we also see some possibilities. So, um, we also saw in, uh, I want to say 2021, I think it was 2021, Jacinda Ardern's uh, government made a formal apology to Pacific people in New Zealand for the Dawn Raids. Does everybody know what the Dawn Raids are? Okay, everyone's shaking their head. Nice. I love being among teachers. Um, so uh, what was extraordinary, of course, um, and you hopefully can see it in that picture, is um, that um, this word, Ifunga, um, is literally the bowing down or the lowering, yeah, 
the lowering um, um, and taking a very humble, submissive, and apologetic physical position, um, allowing that mat to come over you. And so you can see that in the picture. Um, what was extraordinary in this picture is Jacinda Ardern, the daughter of a policeman who participated in some of those raids. Um, and later a wonderful like consulate um, d diplomatic officer to the Pacific by, by all accounts. Um, is standing there um, just just on the other side. You can see Alpito Minister, um, you know, Williams um, Seal holding the side of that mat, and he was one of those families that was impacted by the dawn raids. And at that time, living their family living under a great deal of stress about when that would happen to them. So um, this is really an extraordinary moment for Pacific people in um, New Zealand history, although we continue to look forward to a substantive, um, continuing substantive expression of that apology. Um, the third lesson is to move uh, from the language of vulnerability to the language of resilience and think ahead. And so um, we have these opportunities um, Considering that we're in the midst of all these wicked ch challenges like climate change, and climate change isn't going anywhere fast. Um, it's, it's something we've got to navigate, and it's something we've got to think about, and it's something that we have to future-proof our work about and um, sh show learners that they've got a path um, to, to kind of navigate as, um, the best that they can through that. Um, but there's lessons in the kind of response of Pacific peoples, both anciently and currently um, in terms of things like this. So uh, what you can see in the picture, and I, I love, um, Jess has seen me um, show this before, um, but um, so this is um, probably a little poignantly, this is the island of Maui, right? And we also have those headlines. Um, you will have seen, of course, um, those tragic fires, lives taken, um, the full story is still coming out, um, but, what you, but what we know, right, is that um, residential communities built near the mouth of a canyon, known for hot, warm winds, and your local indigenous community knew that. Um, living in a place where there should have been sugar cane planted, and sugar cane by nature has to be well irrigated, takes a lot of water. And instead, um, there was uh, non-indigenous grasses planted that are highly flammable, plus water issues. Um, hotels had water, and those local neighborhoods did not have wa the water that they should have. So while all of that is still coming out, um, we can contrast that with the way that indigenous people manage that land. And um, I am a little biased here because uh, my Kalama ancestors come from Kipuhulu, which is that little ahupua'a um, just uh, down in, your, uh, in the bottom, bottom right hand of the island. So um, it's also where my name comes from. My name comes from this island. So um, uh, what you see in front of you is an ahupua'a. It goes, it's a ridge to reef ecosystem, which is also your socio-political unit. Um, and within that ahupua'a, the most important job of everybody from uh, high chiefs down to little kids who can understand is to take care of the water. You don't dam the water, you don't cut off the water, um, you don't you know, dirty the water, you make sure that that water can flow right from the ridge um, down to the reefs. When we go to the, uh, when you go and talk to Pacific people in the islands and you talk to them about COVID um, and how it was during COVID or any of those things, um, you don't hear them speaking in terms of vulnerability. You hear other people describing them in terms of vulnerability, but you hear them speaking in terms of resilience. Um, and in Hawaii, we have um, a resurgence of interest in ideas like Aina Momona, which means that everybody, nobody goes hungry and everybody thrives on this land. Um, so the final lesson, um, and I really like this lesson, um, but the final lesson is to never underestimate the power of women in educational transformation. So I have a wonderful, I have several wonderful PhD students, um, but one of my PhD students um, is Teddy Api'i Solomon, 
Um, she, uh, she is a teacher um, and a department head. She was the Pacifica Dean at Tokoroa, and I hope I'm not embarrassing her at the moment, but she's awesome. I'm really proud of her, um, as is our team. Um, she's nearly through her PhD. Um, she comes from that um, strong Cook Islands, Samoan, et cetera, et cetera, community down in the South Waikato in a small um, town um, where most people are employed in things like forestry um, called Tokoroa. Tokoroa is a really special place. I've learned more about it through Teriapii. Um, it's really a place where people from the Cook Islands um, formed like this extension of the Cook Islands, <laughs> um, right? And brothers um, would help brothers and their families come over and you would help the next person to come over. And in this community, the mamas are especially important. So I had no idea, even though I studied the right to education in New Zealand at some point, um, but I had no idea that there were language nests in Tokoroa um, teaching te reo Māori kukiairani in the 1960s. Now that's pretty amazing. Um, where um, these, these kinds of lovely ladies, the same kind of ladies that gather to quilt, um, those particular, that particular quilting style is called te vai vai. Um, it reminds me of a Hawaiian quilting style as well. Um, but you can see them carefully selecting materials. You have to base down the edges and then they embroider the edges. Um, it's time consuming work. But it's not, um, from what I'm understanding from Teriapi, it's not that much different than what they've been doing with kids for generations. So, you know, ensuring that kids get to school, asking them about their homework, forming, ensuring that they know their language and their culture and their community, structuring the community so that at any given time you have three churches right in the middle, <laughs> right by your high school. Um, this is no mistake in this community, but it really, um, strengthens their educational outcomes. So she's of course studying them because they experience these wonderful NCA achievement rates. Um, and that's, you know, that's one of the reasons uh, why she wanted to look into them. Um, so the last, the very last idea um, is one last Olalo no Iao. And um, uh, people who know me know that for a long time one of my favorite Olalo no Iao, um, hands down, uh, was Kamo'opuna i loko o Kamako Maulima. And um, uh, so the literal translation is about the, the grandchild in our arms, like you could say it like that, but there's words in here that are about, um, like Mao doesn't mean just like for now, it can mean like kind of always in our arms, like, and it's like loko is kind of like within, like, like protective, right? Um, but the idea of this, and um, my, one of my daughters just had our sixth grandchild a couple weeks ago, or about a month ago, and we just love our grandchildren. They are the best, thing, best things ever. Um, best thing ever in the whole world, and I love my children, but they know this. Um, and, uh, and we look forward, right, we were looking for this little guy, little Elisha, to come into the world, and anticipating that, preparing for that, and, and trying to make the world a better place for him at the same time. So um, now this really isn't talking about the grandchildren I hold in my arms now. It's the ones we look forward to. It's the possibilities and again, just like that ocean of the great expanse, these are the possibilities that we look forward to. Um, and transformative education is like that. We've got to think ahead to what's there. However, um, another one that I like more recently um, was one that Mary Kavenapukui um, used to start her Olelo no Iao book. And um, it's this one, Ka Mo'opuna i Ke Alo, which means the, the grandchild that's in our presence now. And um, really transformative education, if we wait for systems to be perfect, um, we may be waiting a, a long time, um, but there are things that we can do within our power now, um, within our uh, kind of, um, within our um, responsibilities, within our jobs, within our families, within our communities um, that we can do now. And so um, a couple of these, and I'll just mention one thing, um, uh, a couple of, the, well, a couple of those things is use social media to use Pacific language. Um, don't be afraid to try. 
I know people that don't speak some of our Pacific languages, um, don't want to mess it up. And I really love that, but, but we love it when you try. Um, and that, we're not used to that in, in many public educational settings. We're not used to people always speaking our language. So that is, that is really awesome. Um, if you're a scholar, um, Dr. Apoa Porosa and I would love to translate anything you're doing on the Pacific into a Pacific language and publish it in our journal. Now I'm looking at Bronwyn. <laughs> um, and Sashi. <laughs> um, but please, um, so there's little things like that we can do. I don't want to take any more time. Um, I have a whole list, don't even get me started. Um, but I really appreciate this time to talk to you all. And um, um, I'm just really think we can do this. This, this isn't beyond the realm of possibility. We can do this. And um, sitting in a mostly mana wahine room, we can do this. Um, so I, I humbly offer these, these thoughts, um, and I offer my aloha nui to you all, and um, just say mahalo piha, mahalo. <laughs>